Welcome to the Vasa Museum, the world's most visited maritime museum. It's a summer day in Stockholm in the year 1628, and the new ship Vasa departs on her maiden voyage. 1,000 oak trees, thousands of men, and three years' hard labor have created this pearl of the Swedish fleet. A light gust of wind, and then... In January 1625, King Gustav Adolf signed a contract with the Hubertsen brothers of Holland. The contract was for the maintenance of the fleet and the construction of four new ships at the Crown shipyard on the island of Hwebsholmen, known today as Blasi Holmen. Henrik was a master shipbuilder and was in charge of the ship's design, while his brother, Arendt, was responsible for material purchases for the shipyard. The four new ships that were ordered consisted of two large and two small vessels. Spending money was the height of fashion in Sweden during the 1600s. In palaces, on estates, in the homes of rich burghers and everywhere it was affordable, people competed in magnificence and splendour. Vasa was no exception. When the ship sailed, its upper works were painted a deep, regal red colour. And then there were the decorations, nearly 1,200 sculptures, painted in a variety of strong and clear colours. Everything was intended to reflect a king and an international power with strength and ambition. There is a hive of activity on board the ship. Seamen climb up to the mastheads and from the main top set the main topsail. Even though many of the crew are new recruits, they are not spared the climb to the top, 17 meters over the deck. The sails fill with wind and water foams at the stem. The captain stands on the quarter deck with an overview of the ship and crew as they make their way out into the archipelago. It required 90 seamen and about 20 officers to sail Vasa. They needed to keep watch for other ships, storm clouds and dangerous rocks, so cooperation was important. When underway, the seamen were divided into port and starboard watch rotations. When one group was asleep, the other was on duty. Each watch was four hours long, so nobody slept more than three and a half hours at a time. At night, when the spars creaked, when the rigging strained and the wind shrieked around the masts, when the water was cold, black and deep, and the waves were high enough to make the ship heel over, the seamen would pray to God that the ship wouldn't come too close to land or rocks. They would promise to mend their ways. An enemy ship has been spotted and an engagement is imminent. All hands immediately scramble for their action stations. The crew soak the sails, deck and sides of the hull with water. Pikes, muskets and axes are distributed and the barber breaks out his bandages, saw and knife in preparation for amputations. Below on the gun decks, the soldiers take up their positions by the cannon. Cannonballs, hand spikes, rammers and swabs are positioned beside each gun. Communication was via flags, cannon shot and messengers who rode between the ships. It was a well-developed system, which usually worked, but could easily break down in the heat of battle. It was unusual that a ship went to the bottom after a battle. It either burnt up or was captured, which was the enemy's foremost goal. 
The barber who functioned as the ship's surgeon often had much to do after a battle. Open wounds, gunshot, splinters and burns were common. Living and working on a warship in the 1600s was difficult and demanding. As many as 450 men would work, sleep, eat and share quarters when the ship was deployed to a combat theatre. 300 of those aboard were soldiers and 150 were mariners. The majority of the men lived on the upper and lower gun decks, where they slept seven abreast between the cannon. Each group of seven also shared serving bowls and tankards, although spoons were personal and brought on board by the men. When the crew weren't busy preparing for battle, doing drills or ship maintenance, they had some free time. It was then that they played games and smoked tobacco. Among the artefacts found on Vasa was a backgammon set that one of the officers had brought on board to pass the time. Discipline was paramount and there was a strict hierarchy aboard ship. At the top was the admiral who commanded the fleet and the captain who commanded the ship and crew. Under the captain was a series of non-commissioned officers with the seamen and soldiers at the very bottom. It didn't take long before the first salvage operators became interested in the wreck site. Albert von Treileben of Wermland and his German colleague Andreas Pekel threw themselves into the task with the use of a diving bell. <sighs> a diving bell works in the same way as an inverted glass in water. It had been 328 years since Vasa sank and Franzian, who had had a major interest in wrecks of the period since his youth, had spent three summers searching, without success, for the ship's resting place. So when his sounding device returned with bits of blackened oak, twice in a row at a 20-metre interval, he was certain he'd located the wreck site. Diving on the wreck had been the focus of much attention right from the beginning. Using the latest underwater TV cameras, the diver's progress could be followed on monitors at the surface. It was not a matter of simply lifting the huge ship out of the water. Tunnels were first created under the ship with high-pressure streams of water sprayed with Zetastrum nozzles. Next, strong steel cables were drawn through the tunnels and connected to pontoons on the surface. Vasa was then raised in 18 progressive stages to shallower water until it was finally brought to rest just off Castelholmen in preparation for the final lift. On the morning of April the 24th, 1961, Vasa broke the surface before a captivated audience. In what was Sweden's first live television broadcast to Europe, both local and international viewers could take part in the historical event. When Vasa was raised in 1961, the question of how to preserve such a large wooden ship became paramount. For the researchers, the conservation of all the ship and artefacts found by the divers at the wreck site became a serious challenge and they tested several new preservation methods. Directly after the ship was salvaged, it was sprayed with water so that it wouldn't dry out, split and collapse. Afterwards, Vasa was sprayed for 17 years with the preserving agent PEG, polyethylene glycol, after which it dried for a further nine years. Today the ship weighs nearly 900 tonnes, about as much as six jumbo jets. It's exactly like all ships, which are designed to always be in the water where the weight of the hull is evenly supported by the water. Vasa currently sits in a cradle where the hull is supported by a series of stanchions and is therefore at risk of being damaged. However, a new cradle is planned where the ship's weight will be distributed in a more appropriate manner. With the help of over 400 measurement points on the Vasa, even the smallest movement of the ship's hull can be observed from measurement stations in the ship hall. The measurements indicate that the hull is sinking about one millimetre per year and twisting slightly. 
Vasa's hull is built of thousands of parts, which are held together with over 5,000 iron bolts and 30,000 wooden nails. Some of the bolts are nearly two meters long in order to span the thickness of the ship's massive components. One problem has been that the original iron has rusted away, which in turn has set off chemical reactions, which could eventually destroy the wood. So now, a pilot project has begun to replace the iron bolts with carbon fibre and stainless steel duplicates. After having had problems with the air in the ship hall, a new climate control system was installed in 2004. Now the climate in the museum is stable at around 55% humidity and 18.5 degrees Celsius, which is a good combination for the ship. The work of preserving Vasa is a journey of discovery without end. Never before had anything similar been done, and all that we learn during the course of our work will be of immense help in preserving wooden ships around the world. <laughs>